Welcome, my friends, to a special episode of the Shema podcast. I had the great privilege and opportunity to be invited to a panel discussion in Rabbi Ari Wolby's sukkah and was joined by all the Torch podcasters, the great Rabbi Yokoff Wolby, Rabbi Ari Wolby, Rabbi Yokoff Nagel, and Rabbi Chaim Busco. And we had just a casual conversation talking about this amazing time of year, the Festival of Sukkos. And of course, being around such greatness, I learned so much, so many great ideas that deepened my appreciation and understanding of this time of year. And I certainly want to share it with all of you. So sit back, listen, learn, and enjoy. Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. We are in the presence of greatness. We have with us some of the icons of Jewish education, the greatest rabbis in the state of Texas here, but also not coincidentally, the Torch podcasters all in one room, all under one roof. Of course, it's a porous roof. We're in a sukkah, and we're doing something we've never done before. This is a brand new experiment. It may backfire completely. We'll see what happens. We're going to record all five of us here together today, tonight, in this exquisite sukkah. We're going to record a special podcast. And everyone's going to have a chance to share something about the festival and also to showcase their podcasts because... What can I say? At Torch, we have the best podcasts in the entire Jewish world and probably in the world at large. So we got together and uh, the audio is going to be a little bit different. You know, we're using one communal microphone. I hope it's recording well. But uh, the exquisite audio that you have become accustomed to with Torch, we're just not going to have that. There's other people in the room. They make make noise. I think if someone else walks in, we're just going to force them to come on the podcast. That's going to be their punishment. But we're going to try to get together and just chat as if it was just a, kind of an informal discussion on the festival. And uh, we'll record it. And if it works out well, maybe we'll release it. That's the plan. Everyone's going to be able to share a little bit about the festival. Maybe talk about their relationship with Torch, you know, their history with Torch a little bit. Promote their show and or shows. Give the audience something interesting to listen to, something interesting to chew over for the days of this festival and then call it a day. What do y'all say? It's great. Amazing. Go for Thank it. you, Rabbi, Excellent. for uh, coordinating. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, okay, so in the room we have uh, just an order of uh, seniority relative to our time at Torch. We have Rabbi Yaakov Nagel, who's been here since when? 1998. Since 1998. When I was 12, Rabbi Nagel was here uh, in Houston at Torch, uh, burning the midnight oil, building up the city, and uh, he's still with us. Rabbi Nagel has an incredible podcast, which is... Which, what's the name of your podcast? Well, it's the Dafyomi podcast. It's the one that's ongoing. Dafyomi uh, podcast. That's right. And, uh, of course, I collaborate with uh, Rabbi Aryeh uh, every um, once in a while. And I've been a guest on Dance. So I try to spread the wealth. Fantastic. So, so we have the un- Unboxing Judaism podcast that we do together and the Shema podcast of... And the, and the Dafyomi podcast. And the Dafyomi, of course. And who are you? My name is Arya Wolby, and uh, I have been privileged to be working with Torch since 2005, seven years after Rabbi Nagel laid the groundwork for uh, this incredible organization. And it has been an absolute privilege for the past 18 years to be here and to be part of this incredible uh, operation. Fantastic. Well, I'm Yaakov Wolby. I've been here since 2012. And of course, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here at Torch. It's great to have uh, uh, all of y'all here in, in the sukkah, and I'm excited for this opportunity. I'm Chaim Busco, also known as the Average Rabbi, which is a channel that started some time ago. It's not dead, but it's been sleeping for some time. But I've been making Torch Average since 2019, and uh, more recently launched a podcast with a student of mine named Joe Amar, and we are going through the basic fundamental beliefs of Judaism 
and a whole comprehensive overview of the entire religion, everything you need to know, all the ins and outs. So it's called What is Judaism? Check it out. Fantastic. Dan? Start with my relationship with Torch. Sure. So I am a, a product of Torch. The, the, the Torch rabbis are the ones that uh, began teaching me early on. I became so inspired by them that I wanted to be like them. So I, I launched a podcast. <laughs> How's that going? <laughs> it's been great because basically the whole idea of my podcast was as I went through this journey of becoming from, becoming religious, learning Torah and observing it, I wanted to sort of take my listeners on this journey with me and go through and point out, you know, all the, the pitfalls and things that I encountered so they don't have to. And sort of lead the way as I've gone through this whole process all the way to, you know, living now in this community for a couple of years. And how's that been? How do you stand by your decision? <laughs> <laughs> Love the decision. I will say that, you know, one of the challenges I was thinking about, we were talking about this around the, the Shabbos table uh, uh, not too long ago. But now that I've been sort of living here for a couple of years, I've lost sort of that edge. Like I was, I've been thinking a lot about what would Dan Coleman 12 years ago, what were the questions that he would have? Because now everything's sort of normalized. So I've been sort of brainstorming that over the last several weeks, trying to come up with what would Dan Coleman 12 years ago say, that's really weird what you guys do. <laughs> but I don't want to ask my rabbi because he may get insulted. Those are the questions I want to address in the podcast uh, upcoming in the, next, in the months ahead. I love it. I got, a, uh, I got a, someone unsubscribed from my newsletter. The rabbi talks about animal sacrifices. I'm not interested. So I was thinking, like, for us, it's, like, so self-understood that we talk about animal sacrifices because there are sacrifices in the temple. And that's just, we take it for granted. It's been like that in the book, in Jewish life, for thousands of years. But, like, from an outsider, it sounds, like, kind of strange. Yes. I'm like, ooh, it's a little scary. So sometimes you forget what it's like to be uh, to be normal or crazy. I'm not sure which way to be different. <laughs> Uh, okay, so everyone has everyone has prepared something to talk about uh, about the festival, about uh, Sukkot, or something related to it. We did not compare notes ahead of time, so there's a non-zero percent chance that uh, someone prepared to talk about the exact same subject. And if that happens, I don't know. We'll just either wing it, go with it, whatever it is. Reverend Eagle, you've been here the longest. Why don't you get us started? Okay. Now here's something that I guess. I have some favorite questions about this holiday. Oh, that's what I was going to talk about. <laughs> oh, you oh, killed it. <laughs> but maybe my questions are different than yours. Oh, okay. So I just want to throw out some of the questions. The answers are, the question is always more interesting than the answer. And the answer could be multiple answers. But one of my favorite questions about this holiday is that, as far as I know, and I've been studying this religion, living it since I was a baby, uh, since I was born, really, and uh, it's the only holiday that really doesn't commemorate an actual inv event in history. It's a period of 40 years that it's celebrating. And we celebrate it for seven days. But it's like, what's up with that? I mean, it's, why is this different than all... I mean, that's actually a Pesach thing, but why is this different than all the other nights? But why is this holiday different than all other holidays that commer commemorate an actual dated event? I'm not joking. That's literally what I want to talk about, but I guarantee okay. we're going different directions. I guarantee I'm it. sure, right. <laughs> I'm saying, I just wanted to bring out the question because I enjoy that question so much because it is something unique about this holiday of Sukkot. So, so nothing happened on the 15th day of Tishrei. Is that what you're saying? Nothing happened. Well, I didn't say nothing happened, but if you, we just, we, I give a class between Mincha Marv, and I was explaining, well, if it's commemorating the sojourn in the desert, so then technically the proper time to celebrate that would be right after Passover. Can you imagine going straight from Passover and say, okay, now... It was like, boss, I'm not coming back for another seven days because now that we're out of Egypt, we are in the desert and we are protected by the, by you know, by the cl clouds of glory. So therefore, that's what's uh, that's what's happening now, and we're celebrating that. That's when it should have been, and the only reason why I moved to Tishrei, according to the simple reading, is because 
it wouldn't be as obvious that that's uh, a celebration for the commandment of God. It would be more natural. It's the summertime. You want to get out of the stuffy house and go out into the, you know, and therefore in the spring is when you're going outdoors. When you go into the winter, you start going in the opposite direction. And here we're going out. That shows, that's what the kids are describing this holiday. That's how it describes it. That kind of Which falls is, apart in Houston. Yeah, it does fall you, apart. You didn't Houston. live here, right? And Australia, probably. <laughs> but, um, but all I'm just driving at, which is the point, is that, um, yeah, it wasn't a specific event on the 15th of Tishrei. And, um, and it wasn't, it's not a, forget about that happened on that date. It's not a specific event. It's an experience that was 40 years in the desert that we're celebrating. Which is odd. It's very odd. It's not like Hanukkah. It's not like Yom Kippur. Um, it's not like all the other holidays. And I just find I like the question, and that's why I wanted to throw that question out, discussed. I have some thoughts on it, but I'm, I, I just want to start with that. And we can move on okay. from there. Now, is the date specified in the Torah? Oh yeah, of course. Okay. Yes. 15th day of the 7th month, Nisan ERC Vantamas of El Tishrei, 7th month, 15th day of Tishrei. That's when you have the 7 days of the Sukkah, of the Sukkah, plus 1, plus 1 in the diaspora. It's like 7 days, but somehow it's 9 days in the calendar. Right? It's 7 plus 1 plus 1, right? So it's, uh, it's 7 days plus Shemini Atzeres, right? Uh, but it does say explicitly that this is the date. This is the date. You want? I can throw off some more questions. I let's go. Let's hear. Let's hear. Let's go. A few very interesting questions. Out of all the other holidays, it is the most global, meaning it's a holiday that transcends the Jewish people, in the sense that we are actually focused on the 70 nations of the world, and bringing special sacrifices for each of those 70 nations, which is also super interesting. I mean, normally, you would assume that a holiday that the Jewish people have would be for the Jewish people. Talmud tells us that had the Gentiles known that we bring sacrifices for their well-being, they never would have attacked us and destroyed our temple. They never would allow that to happen because it's what is giving them their blessing. And when do we do that? On this holiday of all holidays, on Sukkot. We don't do that any other holiday that we have a special focus on the nations of the world. Even the prophet that we read on the first day in Zechariah, he says that, right? When yes. When the, They're going to do sukkahs also. Right, right. They'll come. They'll come and bring sacrifices at the temple during sukkahs after the after nations the of, of the Messiah, world. Exactly. Right? So there's something very, very global beyond our own, you know, clan, <laughs> Jewish people. That's 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 going on on sukkahs. It's also the mitzvah that the Gentiles are offered to do at the very la- at the very end when they're given one last chance. Right. To, out of all the mitzvahs in the world, the why they pick that one? It's another fascinating discussion. These are food for thought, I guess. I love it. Okay. So what's your answer? Let's hear the answer. Oh, to me, like I said, the answer is much less It's like important. Pesach. It's all about the questions. So. <laughs> right. It's all about the questions. It's always all Pause about the Pause the questions. podcast and think about it. And then <laughs> right. we'll come back and hear the we'll answer. Come back. Right. Exactly. Uh, my answer, so there's, uh, let's, let's start with some ideas and then hopefully from these ideas you could develop some some thoughts so first of all just because it's not really a very specific event it's celebrating a specific relationship okay a a relationship with God and that is an interesting thing to have, but that's, it's like somewhere in all of our religion, it's important to have some sort of other way to celebrate that's not specific to a a commemoration of sorts. It's important to have that. 
why sukkahs of all holidays that that's what it is is can be discussed but to me i think that it's uh it's a unique opportunity to think that look you know hey maybe maybe there's you know we don't need to focus on a specific event to connect to god we can focus on a relationship and our experience in the world as human beings, really. In other words, what I'm saying is that this, and therefore it's a transcendent holiday in a sense, because that's what it is. It's an opportunity to focus on the existence of humankind being in this world and why, what are we doing here? And in that sense, it almost makes sense if you think about that it has to do with the creation of the world then it's like at least the right month for that because it's happening at the you know very close to the creation of the world to Rosh Hashanah when the world was created when man was created and it's soon after that that we have this unique celebration that's the celebration of humankind and the existence of a world and what God wants from this world and a relationship that we can that we can and should have with God and recognizing that the sukkah is in my mind is actually a a miniature of the world of our man's hand in this world so to speak and that's really the direction I'd like to go with the thought process and what it's all about okay interesting interesting and it's also connected to Yom Kippur right right the comes after the Yom Kippur. Kippur right you can't really do this without Yom Kippur. Yeah, I always see like Sukkos following, you know, Russia and Yom Kippur is the same as, you know, Shaw Blows following Pesach. Like they need each other. You go from coordinating the king, it's very formal, you ask forgiveness, and then after you get past all that formality, then you sit and celebrate with the king. For seven days, and he says, well, one more, one more, just one more. Now that you brought that up, this is not what I was going to speak about, but I was just told this today by a Torch student who's now in yeshiva, Ethan Gates, who I'm sure he would, uh, he would very much appreciate this being dropped, but he said this fantastic idea which ties into this, and I might modify it slightly. But he said one of the ideas is the intensity of being in the sukkah is when you're in your house, you're able to hide. There's a roof over your head, and you can sequester yourself inside, and you can pretend like the outside world doesn't exist. You can pretend like Hashem's not part of your life and you can live as if you've created your own your little bubble. world. In your bubble. But then for one week, we're forced to come outside and face reality. And you're in the presence of the Shekhinah and there's the presence of the, of the divine uh, presence of God. And there's no hiding from that. And you're face to face with what's real and with what's important. And my modification, I think, is what it ties into Yom Kippur, is that normally that would be too intense for us because it's it's humiliating when we come face to it's scary because we don't often live with enough integrity, and so therefore we'll be forced to face reality, and that will contradict the way we're living. We won't be able to handle it. But coming from Yom Kippur, we're clean, we're fresh, and Hashem's given us a fresh start and forgiven our sins, and we're able to come, and, and there's no embarrassment anymore. There's no, I, I'm okay not hiding. I can come out and face God and be in the presence of, uh, of divinity and, uh, and face reality and focus on what's important without that fear of, of that lack of uh, integrity. This, this might be connected to the other point that Robert Nagel brought, and that's that we're talking about the Gentiles as well. And we go outside, sometimes we leave, a little, we leave our little cocoon we leave the shtetl, so to speak. We leave the comfort of our home and we see the world out, out, out large and we actually do remember that we have responsibility towards them. we got to bring our 70 sacrifices for each nation. And that uh, does does kind of have a, a little bit of, a, of, a, of, a, of an aroma, of a scintilla of, of Messiah, right? I remember my grandfather used to always say, Messiah's not for us. Messiah's for the Gentiles. We, were, had, our, we had a revelation. We had our sign of revelation. They haven't. They they need it, and we got to go out there, so to speak, and help contribute and you know bring about that. See that when we get together, some of this new stuff, new ideas ideas surface. This is like uh, this is like the uh, exchange of ideas, and everyone contributes. Rabbi, what do you prepare? 
So, on the same theme, because the theme is Sukkot, you know, the holiday of Sukkot, and uh, to me it's always amazing that it's always immediately after Yom Kippur that we leave our homes, we have the Sukkot, we're sitting in a Sukkot right now. Now, for those of you who are listening to this, um, you may be anywhere in the, on planet Earth, but the weather in Houston at this moment is not very pleasant. I know some people think it is. It's hot, it's humid, it's, uh, um, it's not so pleasant. And yet, we leave our homes. We get out of the comforts of our home. Why? Because what happened in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur was that we say, please, Hashem, forgive us, we have sinned. Hashem, please forgive us. And Hashem says, Hashem salachti I forgive you because you asked. But what led us to sin? What led mankind? Now, if I may, just today, I uh, was with my children at a, uh, at a trampoline park. And the kids were jumping, and a, a woman comes over to me. She says, are you a rabbi? I said, guilty as charged. And she says, well, I'm a devout Christian. Can we talk for a few minutes? I said, please, let's go. And we sat, and she started talking, and she was telling us, she was telling me how we are all born with sin. And I said, well, that's contrary to Jewish belief, because we're not born with any sin. We're born clean, right? God gave us a pure soul, a, a holy, uplifted soul that, uh, that we, are, we are here to keep and maintain clean and hopefully bring godliness into this world. But Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is a time where we cleanse that soul. It's a time when we cleanse from any sin directly with the Almighty. We, have, we don't need any intermediaries. We don't need any, any conduits. And now we're demonstrating by leaving our homes that we're not going to get into the same habits that brought us down till now. Because the first thing that brings us down is habit. We get into a routine, we get into a pattern of luxury, of comfort, of, of materialism. It's not very materialistic in this sukkah. It's hot, it's unpleasant, we want to be inside with the air conditioning. No, 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 no. When you get too comfortable there, you may go astray. Come out of your homes, and we demonstrate how we're, we're taking, making a change in our lives. We're, we're demonstrating physically. We're not going to keep the same routine, the same materialistic lifestyle that we had that potentially caused us to make those errors. We're going to change by leaving. Another amazing part of Yom Tov, of Sukkos, is that it's Yom Simchaseinu. Zman Simchaseinu. It's the time of great joy. It's the time of great joy. And that is, like you mentioned, to feel a sense of responsibility for the nations of the world. So another story of uh, whenever I go to, I have this luck, this mazel. I don't know if it says it on my back. Hi, I'm Jewish. You can ask me any questions. But whenever I'm going up and down in the supermarket, have people stop me. Not always, but very frequently. You're Jewish. And they ask me all these different questions. What are the strings? What's that on your head? Et cetera, et cetera. Hold on. Do you think that you don't look Jewish? <laughs> no, I know I look Jewish. I know I look Jewish, but I don't know what, what like, I'm not the only Jew in this world. You know what I mean? It's like they probably have seen many more, but it, it's just, it, it's, I had once a guy who came over to me at Costco and he runs over to me like, like, oh, I finally found him, you know, and he says to me, do you mind I touch your tzitzit, your, your strings, the fringes? I said, please go right ahead to showcase. You know, like uh, I'm a museum. You can touch to go, go right ahead. He touches it and he says to me, do you realize that the nations of the world, we all look up to you Jews. We look up to you. You need to live up to the example. And it, 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 it occurred to me that wow. something that, Perhaps in a yeshiva lifestyle, they don't tell you this, but the nations of the world really look up to us to be an example. It's a time of joy. It's a time of joy because it's a time for us to take responsibility. We celebrate responsibility. We celebrate the undertaking of responsibility. But there's another aspect of joy, and that is when we're grateful. When we're grateful, when we're thankful for everything that we have, it's a time of unbelievable joy. We would not have one person in this world today on Prozac or any type of uh, uh, D, uh, SSRI, what? Antidepressant. antidepressant or anything. 
you wouldn't have anybody if they were thankful. We think that because we're living in a culture where everyone has so much plenty and please, the, people the, should this, be happy. This, it's just the this opposite. has not been approved by the FDA or if any uh, CDC. The, the WHO <laughs> definitely does not approve. The CDC does not approve. <laughs> Fauci does not approve. But the idea is that the more we're grateful, it's not the more we have, the happier we are. I'll tell you, just to finish with this. When, when my wife and I moved to Israel in 2001, my father-in-law, I think he did this because he wanted us to meet this great tzaddik. But he says there's a, there's a very righteous tzaddik I've been very close to who lives in Mea Sharim. And I want you to go give him, give him something for me. It was a, a check, a donation that he gave for him. I walked into his house. And first, I couldn't find the house because it was so small that if you blinked, you missed, you missed the little walkway that led up the steps into this maybe 10 by 10 foot, not meter, 10 by 10 home. And you walk into this little crickety, crackety, uh, you know, behind this door. And he, he had a little kitchen there and a little teeny bedroom. But he had a smile that was worth a trillion dollars. He was the happiest man alive. Because he had it all. He had everything. Everything he had, he was grateful for. And you, what you saw was a pure happiness that I, I, I almost have never seen another human being before or after. Because he had everything. It was like Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, our patriarch. If yeshli kol, I've got it all. And as long as we go with that attitude, you know what, we're sitting in a circuit, it's not so great. Realize that you've got it all. You have a home, you have the air conditioning, you have a car, you have whatever it is the world that in the world that we're living in today, we're so spoiled. But we're not as grateful. And the more grateful we are, that's why this holiday is the, the holiday when we're leaving our home. It's the holiday of joy. Appreciate what you have. Wow. I, I brought my and, iPad. And, and and the Jewish Inspiration Podcast has now 124 episodes. And we just launched this week the brand new Thinking Talmudist podcast, which has, which has one episode. Bravo. Right? We're looking forward every week to add another episode. I was saying that I brought my iPad because I need my notes because I don't remember stuff as well as I used to. But when you were speaking, I actually added to my notes because I love what you said. Both stuff that you said was were great. The thing you said about joy, I already heard it on the Jewish Inspiration podcast, which I am very dedicated listener to so that i heard and that story i heard but the other point that we leave our house to disrupt our habits and to change our patterns and to kind of start from scratch and rebuild our new habits round up without the same tendencies i absolutely love and added to my notes and that's going to be per- permanently enshrined in uh in my notes uh honor, and, honor uh, so long as uh, google drive uh is uh, extant. I love that. That's that's great. That, that's, it was worth coming and sweating with y'all just to hear that. Rabbi <laughs> please honor us. Sure. Chaim. Chaim, Chaim. <laughs> so, as they swill their wine, thanks to the narration, <laughs> the, the idea that I'm going to share isn't only about Sukkot, it's really also about, mainly about the upcoming holiday, which is Shemini Atzeres, and in the, in the diaspora out here, we split it up into two days. We have Shemini Atzeres, and the second day we, we call Simchas Torah, Simchat Torah. And that's a, a pretty not focused on holiday, and maybe a little bit under undervalued uh, because it's, it's not understood as well. And so I'm going to zoom out a little bit and look at a big the pattern of the three festivals that we have, because really Shemini Atzeres is connected to Sukkot. It really is its own independent holiday, but it is a connection to Sukkot. The this Spas Emes was a great Kabbalist, and he explained as follows: that the three festivals parallel the three layers of the soul. And if you're not familiar with what they are, we'll go a very quick overview. There are three layers of the soul. There's the Nefesh which is the lowest level. The, in fact, the Kabbalists say, some of them say that it's not really even spiritual at all. It's, uh, it's the most ethereal of physicality, but it's the animating life force of the body. It makes things alive. The nefesh, it interacts with the physical world and its life. Above that, you have the ruach, which is translated as spirit, and that's the connector. 
So that connects the nefesh to the higher level, which is the neshama, which doesn't have any interaction with physicality. And neshama is what we normally call the soul. The neshama is a completely independent spiritual entity, almost like an angel. It's a spiritual entity that comes down and connects with this whole system to, to form the human being as we know it. So these three layers of the soul correspond to the three festivals that we have. We have the first one is Passover, Pesach, corresponds to the nefesh because Passover is the birth of the Jewish people and it gave life to this entity that we now know as the collective of the Jewish soul, the Jewish person, uh, the Jewish people. So that's the nefesh, is the life form. Above that, we have the ruach that corresponds to Shavuos, Pentecost, I think it's called. Pentecostal? Is it? Pentecost. Pentecost? Okay. Which One is of the seven weeks, that's what it means. Pent is seven. So. As hard as five. Pentecost. Like the Pentagon's got four sides. Because five, because the Torah was given, maybe. Oh, the, that's what we got the right. Right. So right. that's the point, right? The it's point of Shavuos. the holiday. Shavuos. Shavuos <laughs> is the is Festival the holiday. Of the weeks. Yeah. Festival of weeks. It's the holiday where we got the Torah, and the Torah is the connection that we have from the physical world up to the spiritual realms, and our ability to manipulate the spiritual from the physical. That's the connection. That's the essence of what a ruach does: is it connects something higher to something lower. So we have. Passover corresponds to the Nefesh. We have Shavuos corresponds to the Ruach. And finally, Sukkot corresponds to the Neshama because the whole idea of Sukkot is to is abstinence. Leave your physicality, leave your home, and go dwell with God. It's a completely divorced uh, reality, a divorced uh, life that we, that we experience. Um, and, but there's one more holiday which is Shemini Atzeret. So what's that? So the Svas Emma says something great. He says that Shemini Atzeret corresponds to the, what's called the Neshama Yaseira. The Neshama Yaseira is, literally means extra soul. Extra soul that we get on Shabbos. Now Rashi says, what does the Neshama Yaseira do? Rashi says that it allows us to eat more on Shabbos. So Many seminary girls misinterpret this as saying that you can eat a lot and you don't gain any weight. It's not true. It's a mitzvah to get fat on Shabbos. So you do gain weight. So what does it mean that you can eat more? I'm sorry, I banged the table. It's fine. You've been hitting the table all the time. It's probably crazy. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so what does it mean that you can eat more on Shabbos? The idea of Shabbos, the reason we're eating at all, I mean, Shabbos is the holiest day. We should be completely immersed in, in prayer and Torah study. On Shabbos, we have a special ability to fully engage in the physical world and not be distracted by it and not be sucked in by it. And to use, to, for the ultimate purpose of why we're here is to use physicality purely for a spiritual purpose and not for its own sake at all. That's normally impossible for a human being. But for a Jew who has Shabbos, gets neshama yaseira, gets this extra soul that enables us to, quote-unquote, eat more. It enables us to engage in the physical world and not be sucked in by it and get distracted by the illusion of the matrix. So what Shemini Atzeres is, is after we've gone through this seven-day period of abstinence, which, by the way, like Rabbi Nagel said, is relevant to all of humanity because everyone can relate to the spirituality of abstinence. Go sit on a mountain and meditate. Forget the physical world. Completely identify as a spiritual being. That the whole world can relate to. And that is relevant to everyone. But what's special for the Jews is that last stage where you go beyond abstinence. You go beyond spirituality where you dive deep into physicality. We leave the sukkah. It seems anticlimactic. I mean, this is a beautiful place to be. We leave the sukkah. We go back into our home. And then it's just like, have a meal. What? Nothing, right? Just live. Just be in, involved in the world. That's the epitome of our entire life. That's the, the work of a Jew. That's the epitome of spiritual engagement is to dive deep into the physical world and use it for a purely spiritual purpose. And that should be the focus of once we're armed with our spirituality being in the sukkah, we can go back into the world and, and see the, the code of the matrix. I go, Neo, you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe you do. I don't know.
<laughs> when Neo sees the code coming right. down through the matrix, he's, he's in it, but he sees that it's just source code. He sees that it's just an illusion. We experience the physicality for what it really is, just a construct for us to enable our spirituality. Beautiful. Well, I think that the matrix was like required reading at age. <laughs> At that's, age, huh? Yeah, it's a, that a whole class based upon the Matrix and how the, the whole thing is just a... Muscle for this world. Yeah, well, it's a muscle, but it's also, you know, there's just things that are not real and they're disrupting you and you're, you're, you're in this fake world because there's the real world, but you get so consumed by the, by the attraction of the fake world that it kind of makes you lose what you really were supposed to be after. Mm-hmm. And remind me, Rabbi Buster, what is the name of your podcast? We know you're the average rabbi, and that's been on ice for a little bit. But uh, tell me about the average podcasts. So the current podcast that I'm working on now, I discussed earlier, it's called What is Judaism? What is Judaism? We're, How many episodes? It, uh, I, I don't remember. Eight? I can check. I have it, I'm, I'm an avid subscriber. What it is, I can tell you uh, what the format is. There was a, a great sage, Ramosha Chaim Lutzato, who lived in Italy, and already by the time he was 14, somewhere around there, he already became a master Kabbalist. And his, what made him really unique, in addition to just being a tremendous scholar, was his ability to organize information and present it in a systematic way that's accessible to the average person. And so he wrote a text called Der Hashem, The Way of God, which delineates all of Judaism. It breaks it down. This is what a Jew has to know, starting from number one, what is God? How do we relate to God? All the way to the nitty gritty specifics of what we're doing in our in our religious practice, and it's a it's an absolute masterpiece. It doesn't need my approbation. But what the podcast is is I'm with my student Joe, who's a fantastic individual. He's an earnest uh, person and very intelligent, and so I'm teaching him in English. We go through all the text in word for word in the original Hebrew. I explain it and translate it into accessible language. And he hears it for basically the first time and asks questions. And you get that back and forth of the perspective of an intelligent student hearing the information and, uh, and the explanations. So we have a lot of fun doing it. What is Judaism available on Apple podcast, Spotify, everywhere else you listen to podcasts. Everywhere. Thank you. Bravo. Okay. Dan hit us hard. Let's go. Wow. All right. First, I want to say, like what uh, Rabbi Busco was uh, thinking of it that way. You think about what caused the sin of the spies. They didn't want to leave the sukkah. They didn't want to go into the land. You know, they wanted to have that spiritual experience. Uh, you're right. This is like what it was all about. Was Hashem intended all along to do that? Um, you know, the, the thing I always focus on, I, I found it, uh, I was reading the commentary on the. Uh, Half twelve, we read that you you reference, um, and there was a uh, comment by Rabbi Hirsch talking about as he was as the half twelve Porsche uh, talking about the word Gogamagog. About the word Gog is means roof, and he was sort of discussing it. And you guys can mm-hmm. probably elaborate a little more about it's about this whole idea, the whole battle uh, in the end of days when Mashiach comes is that people people that think they're in power now because they have buildings and wealth or whatever else. They think they're in control. Security. The sense, this false illusion of security, you know, but they really don't. That Hashem's in control. Because right after Yom Tov, I, you know, I did a quick scroll of the news and you see all these things happening in the world. And you see how Hashem's creating this massive illusion that these people are in control and in power and really what he's doing is he's testing our hearts to see, who do you fear? Who do you rely on for your sustenance? Is it flesh and blood or is it me? He's like magnifying this illusion. So I, I was sort of seeing the sukkah, sort of looking at like, like Superman's, you know, he had that place in the North Pole that was his uh, fortress of solitude. The fortress of solitude. I'm not part right. of the H curriculum, <laughs> but go ahead. Okay. So, <laughs> but it's where he would go to recharge. You know, and like get back his powers from from Krypton, I guess. And I was sitting in the sukkah. I was like, "This is what this place. This is what a sukkah is. It's a recharging station for Bitcoin, for Amuna. It's to get away and realize like 
where is my focus? Who am I relying on for my livelihood? Who do I fear? You know, because anything other from Hashem for both those things is wrong. It's an absolute illusion. So I need this time just to like recenter myself before I go back out into the world again. So I start off the year like centered and, and, uh, and I don't get wrapped up in the, uh, the illusion of the matrix. That, I love that's it. That's all I came up with. I love it. That's great. <laughs> what's it called? What's the place called in the North Pole? The Fortress of Solitude. Fortress of Solitude. He got his power from the sun, by the way. Very not Jewish. Oh. Yeah. That's true. But, and what's your podcast? <laughs> My podcast is the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed. Again, for the listeners, I am looking for new episode, new episode ideas. So again, Email me ideas you have. Those questions, again, where you said, you know, these Orthodox Jews, that this one thing they do. That you see in Castro, those people. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's it's weird. What, what are they, what's, what's going on with them? That, I'm not going to ask my rabbi that. that. It'd be insulting, you know, or I'd be embarrassed. I didn't know. Email those to me at president at torchweb.org. I'll keep your name anonymous if you choose. And we'll discuss the idea. One, a lot of these topics I've been uh, sort of exploring, I'm definitely now going to be bringing on, not rabbis, but rabbitsons. Because some of the topics are going to be best explained by them. Like, what exactly is a rabbi? And why can't a woman be a rabbi? Where does it say that? Uh, why can't men dance with women in events? All of these things that are sort of taboo, those are the ones I want to tackle Please send me all your ideas. Well, good luck. Uh, good luck getting my wife on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Timidly, I tried. Uh, Rebbe Zahava will join. Maybe. Dr. Nagel will join. Perhaps. The average Rebbe will join. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll just tell you that as soon as I t- accepted my first job offer in Bridgeport, Connecticut, I was still in Israel packing my bags, and I ran to my grandfather, and I said, I... I heard that the question people are asking most in America is why can't women be rabbis? And he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He says, women could be rabbis. He says, let them learn the material and they can be ordained and be rabbis. What's the problem? I was like, oh. (laughs) You would go to a shul with a woman rabbi? It's a different question of being a rabbi and being a leader of a congregation. So you say like like Devorah, Devorah. We had we had women leaders who were leading the Jewish people. That doesn't mean that. Okay, it's it's a whole different discussion. Okay. Yeah. Save, Save it for the podcast. For podcast. <laughs> when a lot of people hear the word rabbi, what they think is Jewish priest, right? The right. Jewish equivalent of a pastor. Mm-hmm. So that's that's another thing that needs to be tackled. But 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 could sure. women do a podcast for Torch? That's the most important question. <laughs> Definitely, I'm gonna find them. Definitely, I'm gonna bring them <laughs> Uh, okay, I guess I'm the last one left here. Yeah, Your turn. Okay, um, so the question that I wanted to throw out there is the same question Robert Nagel asked, and that is, why are we celebrating Sukkot on the 15th day of Tishrei when nothing that we know of happened on this day? So there are a variety of answers, like you said, that may be... Uh, well, we do says it. that they did. Oh, well, that's what we're going to talk oh, about. Oh, okay, sorry. We're talking about that right now? That's right. What does the villain go say? That they actually, that they, because of the sin of the golden calf, they lost the clouds of glory as a protect, protector. And only after they were forgiven on Yom Kippur were they worthy of getting it back. But not till they had the temple funds ready, which happened on the 14th day of Tishrei, they started that, that they, they, they started building it, then they were able to actually have it. And that's why we celebrate the 15th. I hope I didn't no, no, that's fine. That, 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 that's what the Goan of Illness says. Before you start, I, I just want to say something. That I'm excited to hear this because yes. I didn't grow up religious, for anyone that's listening doesn't know me. And I, at a later age, around 19, 20 years old, attended a yeshiva, a Talmudic academy for beginners that didn't even know how to read Hebrew, which I didn't. And when I was there, that's when I met Rabbi Yaakov Wolby, and he became a very close mentor of mine and one of my biggest influencers. And I remember many, many years ago in Jerusalem, we were on a bus and you told me this. You told me this idea. Maybe it's been modified in years since. I, th- I made this up today, so maybe I, uh, <laughs> maybe I forgot it. I what did I you remember? It. What did you remember? I want, well, I, bits and pieces. That's why I was excited to hear it again. But maybe 
you let's see let's see if i say the same thing if i say the same thing again then i just uh i don't like to repeat content we'll have to edit it out of the podcast anyhow so we have the the sukkah the sukkah we're told it's because of the clouds of glory clouds of glory we got right after the exodus so the question is why don't we sell why don't we eat the matzah and sukkah so to kind of fit with the timeline that's the question so we have one answer gordon vilma says the answer is that well we had the clouds of glory for, for 40 years but there were some lapses there were some lapses actually two lapses when Aaron died, the clouds of glory temporarily went away and Moshe restored them. But during that time, the Amalek attacked. But also, by the sin of the golden calf, a couple, couple of weeks after sign of revelation, clouds of glory went away. Moshe gets the second set of tablets in Yom Kippur. That's day 10 of Tishrei. Day 11, there's the instruction to go assemble the materials for the tabernacle. Day 12, 13, they start assembling it for two days, like the verse says in, uh, in Precious Truma. Day 14, they make another announcement to stop. Don't bring any more donations. And day 15, they start building it. Day 15, the day that we celebrate is the first day of Sukkot. That's when they start building the tabernacle. Because that coincided with the uh, with the restoration of the gods of glory after they had been removed after the Jewish nation sinned. That's what the Golden Vila says. Here's the questions. A few questions on this. First of all, according to his calculation... We have the arrival of the clouds of glory at two junctures, at the Exodus, and then we had them, we lost them, we got them back. So subsequently, they came back. They came twice. They came once, and we lost them, they came back again. And we celebrate, not the, the inception, the initial time that they came out, but when they were restored. And the question is why? Like, why would you... The, the question can be posed again. Yes, I gather they came back after we lost them, but why are we celebrating those clouds and not the original clouds? Question number one. Question number two, we know the Jewish people were forgiven on Yom Kippur. Moshe, with the sin of the golden calf, they lost the tablets. When they get the tablets back on Yom Kippur, they were condemned to be destroyed. When was that? When were they forgiven? On Yom Kippur. So it seems like all the destruction that happened as a result of the golden calf was all rectified on Yom Kippur, except the clouds of glory. So why did the clouds of glory not be restored why were they delayed by it? Exactly. Why are they contingent? You're saying we should have Yom Kippur in the sukkah as well, with the matzah. Uh, well, um, uh, right. according to the Gornville's Gorn- right. calculation, they, they did not come back in Yom Kippur, apparently. They didn't come back in Yom Kippur. So those are the two questions that I wanted to uh, to pose. And I want to I want to suggest an answer. So far, am I uh, in line with what we said on the bus? <laughs> I think I mean, you just told me to go on. Okay, okay. So here's what I wanted to suggest. This is kind of a, a stub that we have to develop more. I want to suggest there's two levels of repentance. There's to do repentance, like an isolated act of repentance, and then there's to actually be a possessor of repentance, a possess- to own the repentance. We know that in, in Talmudic parlance, the word for a penitent, someone who does repentance, is a Baal Teshuva. Is that right? A Baal Teshuva. What's a Baal Master. mean? Master. Baal means, Baal means you own something. You're the Baal Habayis. The owner of the house, the homeowner, is Baal Habayis. So, when someone owns repentance, it says they're Baal Teshuva. Baal Teshuva. Is that right? Is that right? Uh-huh. Yes? Uh-huh. And the verse, and the Talmud tells us, everyone's favorite Talmud, the place where the Baal Teshuva stands, even the Tzadikim Gemurim cannot stand. Even the thing we were of. But it doesn't say the place where someone who did repentance stands, even someone who is a completely righteous person cannot stand. It says the Baal to choose. So I want to I want to suggest that there's two levels of repentance. There's two levels of repentance. Level one is repentance of Yom Kippur. Level two is repentance of Sukkot. That's what I want to suggest. Ready? Hear me out. Like uh, Rabbi Arya said, Sukkot is about kind of continuing Yom Kippur, making sure that not only we, not only we don't we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk, but also not we, we remove the circumstances that brought us to sin the first in the first place. My grandfather used to always say, "Like Yom Kippur is like a spaceship, you go up to heaven, and you're 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 just in the highest level. With you're like the angels, you're like they wear white and stand on one foot, and you." Uh, uh, you appropriate the blessings of the angels. You're at this very high level. You don't need, right? It's just, 
You're spiritual in the, existence. Exactly. Completely subliminal spiritual uh, uh, level of uh, uh, what word you use? Ethereality? That's the word that you use. Ethereal. Ethereal. Rabbi Bosco. Matrix. Matrix. <laughs> what happens after Yom Kippur? After Yom Kippur, the spaceship comes back down to Earth. It re-enters the atmosphere. And what's the biggest danger, my grandfather used to always say, when the spaceship hurdles back into the atmosphere? Re-entry. The re-entry, it's going to fall apart. That's what happened to Columbia, I believe, right? Columbia? It's fine in heaven. So it comes back down. There's all, all sorts of that. Why? Because you can have recidivism. You can have recidivism. And in order to ensure that the Yom Kippur is complete, you have to have a Balchiv to be the owner of it. Not just that you do, not just your repentance. You do repentance. Right? You, you act re- with repentance. You actually own it. It's yours. And you're, ins- you're sure that this relationship is going to endure. Yom Kippur, we do repentance. That's the mess of the day. To do repentance. Circus is about ensuring that we own it. We're we're masters of it. We, we, we have this relationship secure going forward. And perhaps we can suggest, maybe, this is this is kind of a, a way of phrasing it, but maybe the clouds, they did come back on Yom Kippur. But it was clouds of the same clouds at Sinai. What happened at Sinai? Jewish people had the close relationship with Hashem on Sinai. It's like Yom Kippur. But they did the golden calf. And that's not the clouds we're celebrating. It was only once they had Yom Kippur and then they said, we're going to build an edifice. We're going to build an environment that's going to be such a prophylactic against sin. It's going to be a closeness with Hashem at all times. It's going to be a portable sign. It's going to be a kipper wherever we are. We're living it for, for perpetu- perpetuity. See, that's courtesy of the uh, non-studio environment. Someone's driving a bike. Yeah. Poor, <laughs> poor crowd. <laughs> poor crowd. They had to endure that. Sorry for that. Only once we have this portable Sinai, which the Ramban says that the Mishka and the tabernacle is a portable Sinai. It's a portable Yom Kippur. That's what it is. It's the sure that you, you own it. It's yours. It's not something you level your reach, but you could just drop off a cliff. It's yours forever. Now you're about Tshuva. The Makam Shbali Tshuva owned the place where about Tshuva stand. So they can move more cannot stand. Complete righteous people, pristinely righteous people cannot stand. The clouds of the Tzadah Gummer, the clouds of Sinai of Yom Kippur are great. That's not what we're celebrating. We're celebrating Baal Tshuva when you own it. That's what we're celebrating. So the, the theory, the theory is that that's what, you, that's what Sukkot is about. Like you said, it's, it's about ensuring that we create an atmosphere, an environment in which we're going to be sure that we're going to take what we've earned, what we've accomplished, and we're going to perpetuate it throughout the year. And we will, we'll, we'll, we'll be in an environment, in a situation, in, in, this, in this cocoon with God and eventually we'll find a way to take that. You know, I think Shemir says some stories is part of that. It's, it's to find a way to have a departure that's not really a departure. Let's have one day where we celebrate and we kind of cement their relationship going forward. And even when God does leave, even when we don't have a tabernacle, that, 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 that fire in that heart is still present, that Yom Kippur is still alive within us. We own it with the Bali Tshuva. We own it. That's what Sukkot is about. Taking that, 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 that heights, those heights, those cosmic heights that we reached on Yom Kippur, making sure that we don't just have this reentry, there's no risk of recidivism, and that's what we're celebrating. And that's why in the 15th day of, of Tishrei, we start the festival of Sukkot, and it corresponds to the time where we built the tabernacle, which was about maintaining perpetuating Sinai. We're doing that as well now. Perpetuating Yom Kippur, perpetuating Sinai, and ensuring that we are at this peak throughout the year. And that's what those clouds are. And thus, our answers, our questions are resolved. And uh, the next stage, of course, is to figure out, okay, well, how do we do that? Like, what's the, what, what do we do in Sukkot to make sure that we actually foster that atmosphere and that environment? But that's, to me, the, that's the structure. That's what's happening now. What's happening now is we're building the tabernacle, which is going to be the insurance and assurance that Yom Kippur is perpetuated with us throughout the year. Those were my, uh, were my thoughts. I want to add a little bit something uh, that there's many stories that I, I read this year. I was going to add it in my class and I forgot about it. So it's an opportunity to mention it here. There are many of the sages who, after Yom Kippur, weren't rushing to break their fast. They'd sit and learn and learn and learn and learn Torah till way into the night. And then uh, at some point they, they were hungry, they, they broke their fast. What's the idea? The idea is 
is that we're, what are we asking for? We're asking it should be a year of blessing, it's a, bl- a blessing in our Torah and our spirituality, staying away from sin, you know, doing the right thing. And then we just go go right home and, and eat and, and, and drink and talk about uh, the guy who was standing next to me and the chazan was, was, you know, especially for Musaf was terrible. Oh, right. And and we're, we're like, one second, what happened to all the things you prayed for? Go right away and collect it. It's right there. Right? Go actualize what you have asked for. I mean, don't just let, eh, one day, hopefully it'll, it'll arrive at my door and I'll have that success. No, immediately go collect it. And I saw the yeshiva here in Houston, the Masifta, uh, the high school boys, they had a learning program right after Yom Kippur. All the boys went back to the yeshiva, broke their fast quickly, go back to yeshiva quickly. Let's get some, get some learning. It doesn't have to be so long, but claim what you've asked for. You asked for a great year. Here you go. You have a great year. Start it right away on the right foot. Actualize the blessings. I love it. This was so much fun. We, we have to do this now every festival, I, I think. Hanukkah I round like table, this. Pesach round table, with just the cackling oh, noise wait, of cracking matzah. We, we have Rosh Chodesh coming up. Rosh, 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 Chodesh? Rosh Chodesh? We'll have to see how the okay. uh, podcast comes out. I want to quickly run through everyone's shows again so everyone can listen. Now you got a little taste of some of the torch talent. you got a little taste. You know, your appetite, you will whet your appetite. So we'll start with Dan. Dan's podcast is the Shema podcast. The Shema podcast. Podcast, podcast for per, per, But that's one show, right? That's just the subtitle. That's correct. That, that's the, the Shema podcast. Yes. And that's fantastic. Rabbi Nagel is, has two shows. Is that right? Dafyomi podcast. Is this called, just called Dafyomi podcast? Yeah. Are there a hundred the competitors? There are. So how is it different? Does it say Rabbi Nagel as well? It's Rabbi Nagel's uh, oh, Daf Yomi so podcast. Like Nagel spelled N A G E L G E L, not G L E. Rabbi Nagel's right. Daf Yomi podcast, Daf the Yomi best podcast, Daf Yomi podcast in the and country. It's, uh, it and is, there's two daily podcasts. One is the new Daf, and one is the review of yesterday's Daf. Right. Oh, so that's so, uh, that is something that's very unique. That uh, I find that just going over piece by piece, step by step of the previous day's study. Is a way to concretize it. It's a way to take what you learned and bring it forward, which is kind of what we're trying to do on circus. I love so it. So it's like that's what it's all about. And so Daf Yomi, kind of, just just for the total ignorance people like myself, what exactly is Daf Yomi? Daf Yomi means the daily folio, the folio. daily page of Torah study, Talmud study. The Talmud is divided into two thousand seven hundred eleven pages, and every day there's thousands of Jews all over the world that studied the very same folio. It's an idea that started early 1900s. early 1900s, and it took off now a lot, um, especially with the advent of podcasts. <laughs> uh, people realize they can do it easier, and uh, there's a lot of material that they can access so if you want to study talmud but you're, you don't even know which way to open up the page you don't know anything you can listen to the podcast and you can actually be up to date with the rest of the jewish people on the daf yomi cycle right and look it's not about it's not an all or nothing situation the way i understand daf yomi whatever there is no one who is so ignorant that he doesn't get some meaningful thoughts from the daf of study there's always something that Anybody can sink their and mind. What, what happens on Shabbos? There's no, is there a new episode on Shabbos? Um, there is always on, on Shabbos. However, the although I cannot record on Shabbos, but because I do the, re, the review, so the day after Shabbos, you will hear the review of it. What about, so, uh, sorry for me pestering. Today Yom Tif. Today Yom Tif. Today Yom Tif. <laughs> You're on your own. But there are plenty of podcasts that, that do now, it ahead of time or something like that. They do it ahead of time. They do two in a row, and etc. There's no shortage of available, and I'm not saying I'm the only one out there. Um, for some reason, I don't know, close to 100,000 listens. Wow, bravo. <laughs> bravo. Wow. I'm taking credit because I think I it's encouraged good. you to do it. You did encourage <laughs> it. Was a, it was a few people. You were one of them. Uh, and we just said, it's not hard. We just press record. <laughs> That's all you got. And people do. reach out to you. They know your email. Like. Um, they um, they don't. It's not, I guess it's not that easy on the podcast to find me. But people have reached out. But um, I imagine that you know it's, it's, it is available. There is a way to reach me. 
Um, you just have to fight that stuff. Right. I'm sure. I'm sure <laughs> you could go on the Torch Web and find a way to contact me. Rabbi Wolby has my number, and he'll get it to me. Whatever questions you have. And then we have a second podcast together. That's right. And Un- the other unboxing. podcast has the Unboxing Judaism podcast that Ari Wolby asked me to join, and we talk about all manners of questions, things that might come up. Um, it's quite extemporaneous, but I love it. It's uh, questions that people bother people, and uh, thoughts. And we, we just talk it out. And, uh, it's a great, it's a great venue, well, great opportunity. This might be like us trying out a new format. Maybe if it actually, if the audio comes out <laughs> legible in any way, intelligible in any way. That's it's, you know, it's easier to prepare a fifth of a podcast than it is to prepare a whole podcast, I'm sure. Rabbi Busto, once again, your shows. Show is, What is Judaism? What is That's Judaism? the podcast. The podcast is lay out the framework of philosophy. By the way, this is information that, that unfortunately many people who grew up religious going to yeshiva are also not familiar with, and it's painful. But the, if you... There's no monopoly on ignorance. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> but with God's help, we'll finish the whole book. If you listen to it, you will have the entire framework of Jewish philosophy that will answer many, many questions that uh, maybe you didn't even know you had, but things that come up. Um, you know, there's the obvious things like, do we believe in hell? Do we believe in angels? And like, what, what, are, the, what are those ideas? But just an, a framework for understanding our reality. What's life about and all the nitty gritty the details the systems so, um, so I love that. it what is Judaism and it happens to have one of the most iconic cover arts <laughs> I love it yeah. I, you know, it's just if you want to see the average rabbi and Joe it's just a stunning picture so even if you're not going to subscribe search for what is Judaism just so you could marvel at the uh, at the incredible cover art okay I, Rabbi Wolby your show's Three podcasts. Uh, I have the privilege of co of collabing with Rabbi Yaakov Nagel on the Unboxing Judaism a podcast. We have the a Jewish Inspiration podcast, which is a lot of the Musser content and my general weekly classes. And now we recently started the new Thinking Talmudist podcast, which is also a weekly class that hopefully every week will upload a new ep- episode. Uh, we're working on a few more. But I want to a few hear more shows. A few more shows. Yeah, we'll work on oh, wow. a few more. Uh, there's a new one that's it's in the in the it, works. It's in the works. It's in the works. It's classes become very difficult because people ask questions and people are coughing and people are scratching the table and doing things like that. It becomes not such a pleasant experience for the listener. So we're trying to figure out solutions for that. But I want to hear all of your podcasts. You my my podcasts. shows, I have, se- I have seven shows. I guess seven, we'll call it seven shows. It's six plus one. Uh, the Parsha podcast is about to complete its sixth cycle. Parsha podcast, Parsha spelled P-A-R-S-H-A. Parsha podcast. Uh, every week we have two episodes. Now in the new cycle, please God, in a week, we're going to have three episodes every week. Look forward to that, please God. Parsha podcast, the Jewish History podcast, like the average rabbi video, it's been a little bit on ice, but I hope to restart it in uh, the coming weeks. Ethics podcast, which is the ethics of our fathers, which goes through the book of Kirti Avos. Uh, we're towards the end. We're in chapter six. Uh, we're nearing the, near the completion. We started in 2017, so we're nearing the end of that. Uh, the mitzvah podcast, a snapshot of every mitzvah, where you just have 20 minutes, 30 minutes to know everything you need to know to have literacy in every mitzvah. We're up to mitzvah number 102 or 103, something like that. Uh, Then there's This Jewish Life, which is the flagship show. It's been around for 10 years, which talks about uh, a motley mix of Jewish subjects, the festivals, of course, but deep dives into mitzvahs and anything that really is hundreds of episodes already on on all matters of Jewish life and philosophy. Uh, And finally, Torah 101, the unfortunately titled Torah 101, which gives off the impression of it being very basic and rudimentary, which it's not. It goes through the principles, the the philosophical principles, the eschatological principles of our faith, 
who wrote the Torah, what is oral Torah, how do we know it's real, what about Bible criticism, Torah and science, all these exciting questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Right now we're in the middle of the 13 principles of faith, which are the basic building blocks of what we believe as codified by Maimonides. Uh, I just recorded the 13th episode on principle number 11, which talks about reward and punishment. So we're going through it very, very, very rigorously and very comprehensively. Torah 101. I think there's like a lot of shows here. I feel like if someone subscribes to all of this, they'll have years worth of listening, but they'll become exquisite scholars and probably really handsome and beautiful and gorgeous as well, as well as very learned and personable and gregarious and amiable as well, I would imagine. But uh, thank you all. This I, was. I, I want to just share a story that you don't know about. Oh, gosh. Okay. Just tonight, I was at a Scotch and Cigars in the sukkah of a friend of mine, and a guy co- walks over to me, a young gentleman, he walks over to me and he says, I want to just tell you something. I never met this guy before. I don't know. I don't even remember his last name. I remember his first name. I'm not going to mention it here. And he says to me, I live by the Torch podcast. And I proudly said, you're not talking about my podcast. You're talking about my brother's podcast. He says, no, no, no. Both of your podcasts. And he says, I'm going to tell you. I moved to Houston because I wanted to be in the Torch community. You never met him yet. And then he added, he says, I was a soldier in Afghanistan. And the only thing that kept me alive were the Torch podcasts that I Whoa. listened to every day. Well, I, I did see we had a lot of downloads from Afghanistan. So now wondering. you know why. I thought maybe the Taliban, they wanted some good technique. <laughs> oh, wow. Is that wow, That's a great yeah, story. True story. Wow, it's uh, unbelievable. Right, and so reach out. We want to hear from you. And like Dan said, he, he brought this up and he brought it up in a tangential way. But I can't even say how many times I've heard this where people have questions and then they preface it because they're like I will I have this question but I don't want to like sound blasphemous we're not offended we want to hear your questions we like the controversy we're not afraid of it right. nothing's taboo reach out ask questions I, I promise you, you you could you would have to work for 12 days non-stop to get a, a, to get crazier questions than I've got I promise you they make it the craziest yeah. one most of those questions are from me <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right. You can email us at uh, podcast at torchweb.org, Rabbi Wolby at uh, gmail.com, or average at torchweb.org, or no. po- president at torchweb.org, Rabbi Nagel at torchweb.org. Any email that you choose at torchweb.org. Thank you get for us. listening. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. This was a lot of Thank fun. Fantastic. Thank you, Rabbi Yaakov. Bravo. Yes. Bravo. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.